Some people in Athens would not know whether Abuja is a flower, a fruit or a city. It is of course the federal capital of Nigeria, built in the 1980s, and growing nicely since. Little news reaches from sub-Saharan Africa, mostly negative and fragmented. They reinforce the established stereotypes and preconceptions. Sub-Saharan Africa consists of 51 countries. The largest is Nigeria with 180 million people. The smallest St. Helena with 4,000. The first two countries Nigeria and Ethiopia have 30% of the total population. The first five have half the population. And the first ten two-thirds. We often get a piece of news about a small country, and we project it to the entire region. Ebla is a typical example. The epidemic hit three small countries. Together they have 2.5% of the total population of the subcontinent. But Ebola was seen as a pan-African epidemic. Tourists and businessmen cancelled trips to destinations thousands of kilometers away, fearing the deadly virus. In the same way, a military coup takes place in a small country, and we think the entire SSA is run by dictators. The ten largest countries that have two-thirds of the population of sub-Saharan Africa have elected governments. They are democracies. Some of them are weak democracies, with serious faults and deficiencies, but they are not dictatorships. Their governments were not born out of a military coup. SSA, Sub-Saharan Africa, Black Africa is going well, going much better than it did 20 or 40 years ago. The images and impressions we all have in our minds come from a previous phase. Peace and development have been absent from Sub-Saharan Africa for a long time. Great progress has been made recently on both fronts. There are still many conflicts. One reads about 1,000 killed in South Sudan, 2,000 in Central Africa. Boko Haram and its persecutors are said to have killed 4, or 10, or 13,000 people, in the last few years. These are terrible numbers. They are nevertheless insignificant, compared to what happened in the past. Go back a few decades. Mozambique, 1977-92. A civil war supported by the racist regimes of Rhodesia and South Africa. One million dead. A luta continua! Angola 1975 to 2005. A civil war that implicated directly South Africa and Cuba and indirectly the United States of America and the USSR. Half a million dead. Rwanda 1994. A genocide allowed by the UN, Belgium, France and the Catholic Church. 800,000 dead. 2 million refugees. Most of them escaped to the Eastern Congo. An unknown number of tens or hundreds of thousands died in subsequent years. From hunger and disease, and from the unrest that engulfed Eastern Congo for almost 20 years. People's Republic of Congo 1996-2003, and at a lower intensity until 2013. After 30 years of Mobutu's kleptocracy, set up and supported by the imperialists who murdered Patrice Lumumba, armed by the US and the UK, Rwanda and Uganda claimed control of the mythical mineral wealth of Eastern Congo. The People's Republic survived at a colossal cost. This is the largest sacrifice of humans since the Second World War, with three to six million victims, according to different estimates. Remember Biafra, Eritrea, Somalia, Sierra Leone, Sudan, Ivory Coast, etc., etc. There is a geometrical difference between today and the 1980s or 90s. Thousands instead of millions. Peace has made spectacular progress. Today's conflicts concern smaller populations and are less intense. The typical sub-Saharan Africans of today are not fighting some war. They are at home, or at their work, they bring up their children peacefully, and their countries are making good progress. They are as far and as untouched by the tragedies that afflict specific areas as we are. For a few decades after the end of colonial rule, the economic condition of sub-Saharan Africa was getting worse. This trend changes around the year 2000. Sub-Saharan Africa enters a phase of stabilization and growth. It remains to this day the poorest region of the world. 
but the distance from the so-called first world is diminishing instead of increasing. This has to do with the crisis in the first world, but also with fast growth in SSA. Europe has recently had zero or negative growth. Some sub-Saharan economies are growing at 7, 8 or 10 percent per year. The IMF projects an average rate of growth for the entire region of 5 percent per year. Such was the strength of a recent building boom in Angola, that 100,000 Portuguese emigrated there. We are of course talking about very poor countries. 90 percent of the population of the Democratic Republic of Congo have no electricity. However, the construction of a third dam on the river Congo, which is expected to start in 2016, will provide electricity to South African factories and the mines of Katanga, and to a few million citizens. It is part of a series of dams that one day may provide electricity to one half of SSA and be connected to Europe. Electricity will transform the Congo and the entire continent. Is the current growth just and equal for all? No. Not between countries and not within them. Per capita GDP, 2013. $400, 1,200, 2,600, 11,500, 23,600, 55,400. Notice the scale of inequality between countries. Norway has more than twice the per capita product of Greece. Tanzania has three times the per capita product of Congo Kinshasa. Nigeria six and a half times. And South Africa 29 times. Let's get rid of the idea that all countries of black Africa are more or less the same. All European countries are more or less the same. All sub-Saharan countries have a section of their population in extreme poverty that simply doesn't exist in Europe. And this means hunger, disease, illiteracy. There is, however, progress. On a global scale, progress in the last 30 years has been spectacular. The percentage of the very poor that have been living on less than one euro a day was more than 40% of the total population of the planet in 1981 and has dropped to less than 20% by 2008. However, this global trend hides important regional differences. This diagram by the World Bank shows more detail. This is Eastern Asia, which contains China. It started with nearly 80% of its population in extreme poverty in 1981 and dropped to less than 20% by 2008. This is Sub-Saharan Africa. It was in a better condition than China in 1981. The percentage of poverty increased in the 1980s, stabilized in the 1990s, and is dropping since. The percentage, not the absolute figures, not yet. The latest figures show unfortunately, that the number of hungry people is still rising in sub-Saharan Africa. From 176 million to 214. But the percentage of the hungry in the total population is dropping from 33 to 24 percent. From one third to less than a quarter. This UN diagram shows maternal mortality per 100,000 births. Each group of columns is a region. Each column is a year. 1990, 95, 2000, 2005, 2010. The last group of columns on the right is Sub-Saharan Africa. It has more deaths than any other part of the world, but they are dropping. They are diminishing. In education also, SSA has the worst results in the world, but is improving. In 1990 only 52% of children completed primary education. In 2010, 69%. Therefore, Sub-Saharan Africa is not well. But is going well. It is making progress. It is moving in the right direction. This is also shown by progress towards the Millennium Goals. SSA will not achieve many of the Millennium Goals by 2015, but a little later. The overall delay of SSA has something to do with its very rapid population increase, as the spectacular successes of China have something to do with population control. SSA started with less than 200 million inhabitants in 1950, employed in the primary sector in the large majority, and is approaching today 1 billion inhabitants. For a long time, the annual increase in agricultural production was slower than the population increase and many countries resorted to imports and to food aid. 
Today food production is increasing faster than population. This FAO diagram shows the total increase in food production with the year 2000 as base year equal to 100. By 2012 total production had increased 45%. Per capita production only 11%. Three quarters of the increased production were absorbed by the increasing population. Despite its increased production, the primary sector cannot employ the additional 800 million people that SSA has added to its population since 1950. So there is massive unemployment and poverty and an increasing proportion of the rapidly increasing population is emigrating to the cities and to other sectors of the economy. In 2010, an influential report showed that recent African growth was coming from many sectors. Resources were important, but growth did not come only from resources. The largest city of sub-Saharan Africa is Lagos of Nigeria. Here converge all the dreams and all the nightmares of black Africa. Of our dream is now. Nothing you are looking for. The entrepreneur fight here. Is the place to be. What are they saying? The city of our dreams. There is nothing you cannot find in Lagos. This is the place to be. What is this enthusiasm? The rich are certainly having a good time in Nigeria and most of them are gathered in Lagos. However, one in four economically active Nigerians is unemployed. One in two amongst the young. The people in this stadium are applicants for a few vacancies at the immigration service. The Nigerian economy is creating one million new jobs a year in a country that is adding each year four million inhabitants to its population and two million to its labor force. These numbers are correct as an order of magnitude. They are on purpose very approximate to indicate the uncertainty about their accuracy, especially in relation to the so-called informal economy. Narrowly defined, the informal economy concerns illegal activities such as prostitution, drugs, or the smuggling of oil. A wider definition includes many legal activities. In the primary sector and in rural areas, a significant share of GDP is often self-consumed or exchanged away from formal markets and state supervision. At the same time informal networks, sometimes with religious or tribal affiliations, often provide medical, educational and even financial services. In the cities, an army of self-employed, underemployed, constitutes the informal economy, which is often directly linked to the formal one, distributing and maintaining its products. In this wider sense, the informal sector is said to produce nearly 60% of the official GDP. At the same time, it is said that the size of the Nigerian economy could be significantly larger if all informal activities could be measured accurately, and that unemployment is both larger and smaller than the official one. In other words, there is massive informal part-time employment or underemployment. High unemployment, rapid urbanization, and fast uneven and unjust growth. In a context of marked divisions between classes, regions, tribes, languages, and religions. And the destruction of bad and good traditional structures and customs. Generate terrible tensions. <laughs>
Our political elites are allergic to democracy as well as the erotic in their pursuit of power. Nations fail as a result of weak institutions. Our military has not been able to protect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Nigeria because its orientation was mercenary. It was meant to protect the ruling class. Our judiciary has been weak in settling election controversies because of corruption and nepotism. Politics is seen as a source of wealth, an avenue to reap back profit from the state. The state is more or less like a privatized entity where the so-called investors, the political godfathers, must reap their profit. The British, they came down to Nigeria to mumble jumble laws. Now when you try to bring people of different cultures and language and try to put them together as a nation, what you get is chaos. Boko Haram has become a household name in Nigeria. Hundreds of thousands of people in the north have been displaced and there is no guarantee that they will get the, get the opportunity to exercise their right to vote. Ethnic agitations, which seem to be the in thing in Nigeria today, do not necessarily mean that Nigeria will break up. Everybody wants to be heard. Nigeria is a multi-ethnic community, having over 250 ethnic groups and over 510 languages. The only way to neutralize the tension between these ethnic groups in terms of leadership is by elections. Afghanistan, regardless of the Taliban, conducted a successful election. The United States wants Nigeria to win its war on terror and it's prepared to assist Nigeria with every means possible. The Nigeria we see today has tried despite threats. Even with the threat of the secession of Biafra, we still survived as one Nigeria. Of course, the threat should not be underestimated. But the existence of a threat has a positive, cognitive, and psychological effect to wake up Nigerians. Your vote is your right. It's your responsibility and it's your power. And remember, with great power comes great responsibility. Thank you. Are you aware of any alternative that has been provided to elections? So far as I know, elections are the best system of governance for any race under mankind. It has been proven and tested from its origin in Greece to its modern entrenchment in the United States of America. We've been practicing democracy for the last 14 years. Yes, we are not perfect. Yes, it has its dooms. But however, we are practicing it and we are making progress, definitively. But the topic of this debate it's whether the 2015 election will make and not man Nigeria. And not for us to provide an alternative to this. The 2015 election will man Nigeria. Thank you. Nigeria is today the largest country of Africa, with 180 million inhabitants, and the biggest economy of SSA with a total GDP of approximately 400 billion euros. Lagos is the largest city of Nigeria and of SSA. The population of Nigeria is increasing by 2.5% a year, and that of the city of Lagos by 4.7%. It is nearly 14 million in 2015, and is expected to reach 18 million by 2025. Some Lagos state officials estimate the current population of the wider area to be 22 million, and predict that within a few decades Lagos will be the third largest urban area of the planet, after Tokyo and Bombay. It is the economic nerve center of Nigeria. It produces 20 to 25 percent of the country's product and distills its dynamism, but also its enormous problems. The phrase, this is the place to be, describes the reality. Lagos is a population magnet that attracts poor and rich alike. In Africa in general, and in Lagos in particular, an urban middle class is rising as sectors other than natural resources are developing. Only 14% of Nigeria's 2013 GDP came from natural resources. Nevertheless, Nigeria still has the characteristics of an underdeveloped country, with a large agricultural sector, little manufacturing, and significant exports of raw resources. If however, rather than the sources of GDP, we examine the sources of GDP growth, we discern a restructuring of the Nigerian economy. Agriculture with 22% of GDP, generated only 9% of growth, and resources with 14% of GDP, generated only 5% of growth. 
On the other hand manufacturing with 7% of GDP, contributed 14% of growth, and insurance finance, and construction, generated, each one of them 7% of growth, and finally trade with 17% of GDP, gave 20% of growth. Within various which also have a significant contribution to growth, a very small sector distinguishes itself with 1% of GDP and 4% of growth. Entertainment, which means mainly Nollywood, has explosive growth. However, even though the dependence of the Nigerian economy on oil, and of SSA more generally on natural resources, have declined. The dependence of government revenues remains high. 70% of the revenues of the budget of Nigeria, according to the Minister of Finance, come from oil. So the falling price of oil will hurt the Nigerian economy and will reduce its rate of growth. But it will not reverse it, as it often happened before the year 2000, when GDP was going up and down from year to year, according to the price of oil. DHL announced recently that its fastest growing markets were in Africa. What does this tell us? It says that post offices have serious problems in Africa. But it also shows that a widening professional and business class needs better postal services and can pay for them. Lagos, according to Fitch, is the key driver of the Nigerian economy. And 80% of this economy is made up of services, construction, transport and manufacturing. Who participates in this fast-growing modern economy? Very approximately, about one-third of the population of Lagos. The remaining two-thirds are poor or very poor and sometimes are having difficulty even finding food. Nevertheless, poor immigrants continue to come because realities and expectations are better than in their place of origin. A university study of the last decade found that in the poor neighborhoods of Lagos, street food contains 150 milligrams of lead per gram of food, in the mid-income neighborhoods 75 milligrams, and in rich neighborhoods 0.2 milligrams. According to the World Health Organization, 0.001 is the acceptable maximum. Same situation with house water. Heavy metals, bacteria and bad microorganisms show great preference for the poor, but rarely leave the rich untouched. Wow. Can you see that the tap water we drink? Poverty, high population density and traffic congestion go together with polluted, unsafe food and water. The same study, however, showed that 72% of immigrants never want to go back to their place of origin. The average immigrant eats more meat, eats more fish, drinks more milk, uses more water and more electricity than in his place of origin. However poorly they may live, they continue to come because they find something more in Lagos than they found at home. Even in rubbish, some people find something that they couldn't find at home. A different 2013 study shows that inequalities in rural areas are even greater than in urban areas and some services reach more people in Lagos. In Nigeria as a whole, only 25% of children are vaccinated in the second year of their life. In Lagos, 54%. Tension and aggression are however much higher in the city. 24% of women in rural areas have experienced physical violence since age 15. In the cities, 33%. In Lagos, 44%. In the state of Borno, the stronghold of Boko Haram, only 15%. Concerning religion, the report shows that in Nigeria as a whole, the percentage of women that have experienced physical violence, after the age of 15, is 44% amongst Christians, and 13% amongst Muslims. USAID, UK aid, the UN Fund for Population Activities, and the National Population Commission of Nigeria, have cooperated in this study. At the same time, although the country is supposed to have free, universal primary education, there are often no schools in the slums where immigrants pile up. Parents send their children to private schools, and pay by the day. Even the poorest have some disposable income for expenditure beyond survival. Some indicators show rapid progress across Nigeria. In 10 years the use of insecticide-treated nets 
has spread from 2 to 50 percent of households. Female circumcision is dropping fast. One third of women aged 45 to 49 years old have had it in their childhood. Only 15 percent of women aged 15 to 19 years. Three quarters of urban households and half of rural households have access to improved water sources. The rest get their water from sources of unknown quality. A fifth of urban households and three-fifths of rural households have primitive storage. That means they use the open countryside or a simple pit as toilet. The rest use modern toilets sometimes private, otherwise shared. An urban majority and a rural minority have electricity. Television goes with electricity. A large proportion of the population is illiterate. More women than men. Many more in the villages than in the cities. Fewer in Lagos than in other cities. Far too many in Borno. Polygamy is an exception. In most households there is only one wife. Childhood mortality is much higher in rural areas. The percentage of undernourished children in rural areas is double that of urban areas. Nigeria defined in 2010 a poverty line which corresponds in purchasing power to one euro approximately. If someone's daily consumption is below one euro, he cannot purchase the calories required to feed an average person. According to the 2013 household census, one third of the population of Nigeria, that's 60 million people, live below this poverty line. Another 80 million live between 1 and 2 euros. The remaining 40 million belong to the so-called middle class, as defined by the African Development Bank. They are not of course in the middle, but at the top of the social ladder, but it is assumed that anyone spending at least 2 euros a day, belongs to the middle class. Out of those 40 million, 25 million spend between 2 and 3 euros a day. The remaining 15 million start at 3 euros, that is 540 euros a month for a typical six-member family, and extend to the stratosphere of grand luxury and private jets. Separate urban and rural curves show around 45% of the rural population in extreme poverty, and around 15% of the urban. We can guesstimate the distribution of consumption between large sections of the population. This adds up to 95 billion euro. Let's say 100. Out of the 400 billion of the Nigerian GDP of 2013, 72% went to household consumption. That's 290 billion. Let's say 300. Out of those 300 billion, 100 were consumed by 92% of the population, by 165 million people, and 200 billion by 8% of the people, that is 15 million people. But even within this group of 15 million people, there is great inequality because the group has an average annual consumption of 13,000 euro, but starts at 3 euro a day, which means 1,100 a year. Therefore at the top of the top, a couple of million people are having a wild party. Which explains why Nigeria has a higher consumption of champagne than Russia or Brazil, and is considered a very dynamic market for luxury goods. Remember that we are not talking about income, but about consumption. And we are not talking about patrimoine or capital, as defined by PKT. Income inequality is certainly greater than consumption inequality. The poor spend all their income, they borrow, they beg and they steal. The rich save income and accumulate capital. Thus rises the need and the ability for the famous or infamous Echo Atlantic. Have you seen my beautiful baby? Have you seen my tomato baby? Oh, ELA, baby, suffering the cool me temper. Ada, baby, na sugar, sugar. Uh, future financial city of Africa. This, you know, will be uh, a landmark because five million square meters is not a joke, it's a whole city. New jobs, new opportunities, massive jobs. New privatized African city heralds climate apartheid. Nigeria's Echo Atlantic augurs how the super rich will exploit the crisis of climate change to increase inequality and seal themselves off from its impacts.
behind the project, a politically connected financial empire, and a slew of African and international banks. The Guardian states the obvious, the screaming class characteristics of this private and not privatized city, but misses a crucial dimension. They are investing in Lagos instead of New York or London. This is the news, not that the rich build for the rich. Echo Atlantic promises housing for 250,000 rich, 700,000 square meters of office space, for multinationals, bankers and financiers, autonomous private water supply, sewerage, drainage and electricity, and 150,000 jobs for the inhabitants of the other Lagos. What is happening though to the other Lagos? There is much progress, and things are getting worse. What does this mean? What does this mean? Lagos adds half a million people to its population, each year, with zero ability to pay taxes. The state authorities cannot cope. Lagos generates up to 10,000 metric cubes of rubbish a day. Only 40% is collected formally. The state has a housing program. The cheapest houses cost around 15,000 euros. They are too expensive for most people. They deliver 200 houses per month, a drop in the ocean. Every month we can make 200 people homeowners if they can afford it. Lagos has a larger population than Greece. The state's annual budget is of the order of 2 billion euros. One thirtieth of the budget of Greece. The federal budget, for a country of 180 million, is of the order of 20 billion euros. One third of the budget of Greece. Notice however, the relationship between current and capital expenditure. Half the state budget has actually been spent on capital expenditure, and a quarter of the national budget is also supposed to be spent on capital projects. Under such tight financial constraints, the state government encourages financiers to build their own city and proudly advertises its achievements in 2013, however inadequate they may be in comparison with existing needs. Roads, bridges, clinics, schools, a small energy plant, sewerage works that have reduced flooding, renovations that cause great pain. Informal construction and trade often create suffocating conditions in central nodes of the city. The state is obliged to intervene. They can neither compensate nor transfer the inhabitants and traders to some other location. They can only evict them and demolish the illegal structures. The tension is extreme and sometimes ends in tragedy. Demolish everything. Where do they want them to go and stay? It, 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 it's what crime. The results after innovation are spectacular. Orderly traffic, proper parking, street lighting, etc. But a different class of people enjoy them. The very poor have gone somewhere else. A light rail is under construction in Lagos. The first of seven lines is due to be delivered within 2015. It is funded by the state government with a loan of $1 billion from the World Bank. The operation together with the generation of electricity, the purchase and maintenance of the rolling stock, the signaling and the tickets will be handed over to the private sector. A minority of citizens will benefit, those that live or work along its path and can pay the ticket. This first line of this seven-line mass transport system perfectly symbolizes the rise of a middle class and a mass market. It is a minority today. It is expected to grow into a majority tomorrow. But let us return to the greater picture for a minute. It is often said that Black Africa has sent, legally or illegally, 10 euros to the first world for each euro of aid it has received. We do not have accurate data for these flows, especially the illegal ones, but many analysts have shown that Africa gives, does not receive aid. Up until uh, World War I, uh, uh, countries like uh, France or Britain, uh, in fact, had a permanent uh, trade uh, deficit with respect to the rest of the world. The rest of the world was working for them, and this was fine because they were receiving capital income from the rest of the world that was much bigger than their trade deficit, so they were able not only to pay for their deficit, but to keep buying the rest of the yeah, world. Yes. You know, I think it would be a mistake to believe that this only belongs to the past. And, you know, we still have today the situation of entire countries, you know, including in Africa, of course, where national income is a lot less than, than uh, domestic output because a big part of domestic output goes abroad.
the national income of Nigeria is lower than its domestic product. Eight or nine percent of domestic product goes abroad. In contrast, many first world countries have a greater income than product. 102 percent in the US, Germany and France in 2012. This hemorrhage has nothing to do with public debt. Nigeria succeeded in buying back 90% of its external debt in 2005. From $36 billion in 2004, its external debt was reduced to $3.5 billion in 2006. Its overall public debt, including internal and international borrowing, dropped from 64 to 12% of GDP. In 2014, it stood at 13% of its revised GDP. Colonialism may have first responsibility for the long-lasting hemorrhage of sub-Saharan Africa. Local kleptocrats, exporting all they stole abroad, also had a major contribution. This seems to be changing. The top Nigerian kleptocrat was a batcher. He is said to have looted five billion dollars. A batcher cooperated closely with Shell in the suppression of the resistance to Shell of the inhabitants of the Niger Delta. His greatest achievement, however, is not the theft of five billion dollars or the murder of several enemies of Shell. It is the transformation of the Nigerian National Petroleum Company from a producer to an importer of petrol. This was in the interests of a local mafia that profited from the legal import and the illegal trade and export of petrol subsidized by the state. When in 2012 the government attempted to abolish the subsidy, there were massive protests and the protest movement had at least 10 dead. This is how the slogans, stop importation make our refineries work, and remove corruption not subsidy, arose. The government retreated, and partially reinstated the subsidy, although the economic arguments against it were overwhelming. Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Sunusi Lamido Sunusi, had argued in 2011, prior to the attempted removal. The question is, do you subsidize consumption or do you subsidize production? Do you subsidize the poor or do you subsidize middlemen and rent seekers? If you subsidize consumption of imported products, what you are doing is creating production facilities, keeping them open abroad, creating jobs abroad. Don't subsidize the importation of petroleum products. Subsidize those who want to set up refineries. Here we say we are selling at 65 Naira <coughs> in Cameroon, in Niger, in Chad, in Benin. All over West Africa it is for 140 Naira. It does not take rocket science for me to know that if I can import into Nigeria, get this subsidy, I have a margin of 80 Naira, enough to bribe everybody from here to the border and across. <laughs> you have created an opportunity for rent seeking. The difference between 65 and 140 is so huge one trillion naira is enough to bribe anybody to sign anything between january and november the total amount of foreign exchange we sold to petroleum marketers at wdas and interbank was in excess of eight billion dollars over the same period the total amount of subsidy that was given to these same marketers was another eight billion dollars. That is 16 billion. The total amount of money that the government earned that came to us from the entire oil sector in the same period was 200,000 less than that. We spent more money paying for LCs and paying subsidy than we earned from the oil sector. Now, you produce one barrel for 80, your share of revenue of that barrel is maybe 50%. So you can, for effectively, you can effectively say it's one barrel for 160 Nigerians. They need power, they need infrastructure, they need medical care, they need food, you need to pay salaries. Women are dying every day in childbirth. Children are dying of malaria. People are dying of AIDS. You need roads. You need petroleum subsidy. Please give me your hierarchy of priorities. What would you sacrifice? We are taking one third of that money and paying petroleum subsidy, leaving two thirds. And out of that two thirds, Ngozi will tell you 70% goes to pay salaries. 
if the oil price crashes again by 30 40 percent if the naira goes to 200 naira to the dollar when you can no longer pay salaries when inflation goes to 18 percent then we will know what a crisis is look Ngozi said we borrowed 850 billion naira last year this year 850 billion the subsidy was 1.1 trillion you borrowed to only pay part of the subsidy so all the, the entire federal government debt was not even sufficient sufficient to pay the subsidy the deficit that I want to bring to three percent if there's a shock to government revenues today if there's a shock to reserves what will happen the deficit goes to six seven percent that is how greece got there a population that is poor by every hdi you don't have power you don't have infrastructure your agriculture is disconnected you don't have irrigation if you are already not earning enough to do that when you borrow to subsidize it is our children that are subsidizing us this was an indirect attack on the vested interests behind the subsidy and sanusi continued as governor when however in february 2014 he spoke openly and directly about 20 missing billion dollars of government oil revenue pointing the finger at NNPC, he was dismissed outright, for financial recklessness and misconduct. Shell sold in the summer of 2014 some of its blocks in the Niger Delta. To Nigerian companies. Nigerian companies have purchased oil blocks in the past, but resold them quickly because they didn't have the financial and technical capacity to exploit them. They have the capacity today, according to the Financial Times. Shell and the other oil multinationals are not leaving Nigeria. They are leaving the troubled Niger Delta, where they're facing costly resistance and theft, and are escaping from the crime scene of an environmental murder of first planetary order, for which Shell has first co-responsibility, along with NNPC and all kinds of rebels, terrorists and smugglers. The last major leak was in November 2014. In January 2015, Shell agreed in an out-of-court settlement to pay $80 million to villages affected by some 2008 oil spills. According to a British study, Nigerian oil theft is of an industrial scale. The network of corruption touches the army and the political establishment. As many as 100,000 barrels a day may be smuggled, worth a sum of the order of 2 billion euros a year, equivalent to the annual budget of the state of Lagos, or one-tenth of the federal budget. Shell itself estimates that the value of stolen oil may exceed 5 billion euros a year. Aliko Dangote is the richest man of Africa and the 23rd richest man in the world, according to Forbes. According to a 2005 classified cable of the American embassy, included in the WikiLeaks, Dangote was intimately connected with the governments and the wider establishment of Nigeria. It is publicly known that he funded the electoral campaigns of former President Obasanjo. His companies represent today one quarter to one third of the value of the Nigerian stock exchange. The opportunities that we have here in Africa is, I think, second to none. We've moved up from, according to Forbes, $16 billion last year, now $25 billion. And the big question is, where do you go from here? Uh, the program that we have at the moment is trying you know to grow in terms of the group business about 500 uh, percent in the next five years and we think that by the time that we finish 2017 we should have at least a uh, market cap of about 100 billion uh, dollars so annual rate of growth between 30 and 40 percent that we are going to have uh, you know refinery with petrochemical and polypropylene uh, making tires Fertilizer will be about 2.8 million uh, tons. The Nigerian consumption of nitrogen fertilizers is very low. Next business will be the cement, uh, which by 2016 will going to be over 60 million tons in the sub-Saharan Africa. Even this year will be the largest producer of cement in, in sub-Saharan Africa, right. with 40 million tons uh, by this year. If 40 to 60 million tons of cement mean nothing to you, check in the Wikipedia the production of some countries in 2005. Nigeria was producing 2 million tons and Greece 15. And if the correlation between cement production and economic growth is not clear, 
check the distribution of world production in 2010. The Chinese seem to be building something, eh? In the next four or five years, there will not be any sugar imports into Nigeria. It also doing rice, a million tons of rice. This will make us to actually employ about 200,000 additional you know, workers. So like what you call import substitution. Nigeria imports maybe up to now $1.2 billion worth of milk. Why should we import milk? Why should we import sugar? Why should we import rice? But I think what we need is to have an inclusive growth so that it will trickle down, it will hang over there. If we want to also live in peace, we need to give something back to people. Absolutely. Yeah. Notice the last phrase. He does not say, If we want to also live in peace, we must give something to people. He says, If we want to also live in peace, we must give something back to people. Thus spoke Ali Kodango 10 in March 2014. Ten months later, the price of oil has dropped below $50 a barrel. The national currency of Nigeria has been devalued. The country's budget has been curtailed. The forecast annual growth of GDP has lost one percentage point. The Nigerian Stock Exchange and Angote's companies have lost a quarter of their value. A difficult conjuncture, but also an opportunity. Cheap oil and the loss of government revenue make more feasible and more necessary the suppression of smuggling and the raising of some taxes. Reduced profits from the export of crude oil make other investments more attractive. Some brave political decisions will be required and can only be finalized after the difficult presidential elections of February 16, 2015. How do you rate your first term in office? We're trying. Jonathan! Jonathan! Whose word is it? Whatever happens will change the speed, but not the direction of development. Dangote himself is moving ahead with his refinery in collaboration with two American companies. It is expected to start working in 2017. So what's the overall picture of Nigeria? An accumulation of capital has taken place, in whatever way it has taken place. Will this capital be invested in Nigeria? Can the return from investment be higher than the return from theft, or the return from capital export, to New York and London? There is rapid population growth and urbanization. There is massive poverty unemployment and underemployment. But there is also a so-called middle class of 40 million people with a demand able to sustain significant investments. The people in their prayers or in their protests when begging or rising up in arms are asking for an end to the theft and export of the country's wealth and they are looking for work to improve their lives. How far can they go? What is the future of Nigeria and of Sub-Saharan Africa? This question will be answered in a subsequent video. This video ends with some German music. Comme c'est temps que nous avons le temps de signer dans ce terrain. Et M. Zago Mitna Telo, est-ce que nous avons Ces petits trous-là, vous devez arriver à souffler. Ce qui n'est pas facile, il faut apprendre, rien que pour faire ça. Et ça un peu caché. Mais dans mon âge, à ça là qui on dirait na ba moi ba empreinte moko il y a ba rythme africain et ça Beethoven. Pam pam pam. Vous devez attaquer, vous n'avez pas attaqué. également de notre intérêt à tous que ça soit bien parce que le problème qui est là vous n'êtes pas présent on aura joué en plein air Donc le tout premier concert public est l'OSK Oral. Le Congolais. Le Congolais, c'est un défaut. Le Congolais, les Congolais. Être Congolais, c'est un animé en Rosalanem. Là, je t'ai garanti. 
dès que tu sortiras de ce concert, si vous êtes dessus, j'abandonne la musique. Avec ce travail de musique, il n'y a pas de limite. C'est comme un escalier, on monte, on monte.